So I'm watching this no thank you video that I think I watched a lot of several months ago and then forgot everything that happened in because it's way too fucking long. But I decided I would watch it because I don't remember anything that happened in it because it's way too fucking long. And unlike those 12-hour podcasts, it's actually a YouTube video. Um, I was watching this video and he was talking about all of these technical issues that he's having with these old laptops and like the various software side ways in which he would get around these technical issues and the trials and tribulations therein, the long process by which you would make a basic thing work with these old computers. And it just hit me. This guy is a need. You know, he gets up, does things on a computer to then get up again and go do things on a desktop computer. And that's life for the most part. And I started to think about like these old computers and all the technological problems that come with them. And it hit me. The reason why people like this guy use these old computers is because it creates problems for themselves. When you're in need, you have very few problems, very little going on, and without things to solve, your mind quickly becomes bored and depressed. And so what you have to do is artificially create problems by doing shit like this, by just having these old computers that you run as daily drivers for no reason and then having to do all this complicated nonsense software wise sometimes hardware wise to get a basic thing working and i don't know how much time you guys spend talking to these types of people but a lot of them a lot of them are into this shit and i think they're into this shit because it gives you something to do while you're in need. Um, I personally like these computers just because I, I like the way that they look. And I find it easier to neuter some of the, the more modern uh, potential backdoors that exist in them. Uh, but that's me, you know. I, I like old school computing. Um, from a technological perspective, I think it's interesting. From an aesthetic perspective, I think it looks nice. Um, but I've always had problems to solve. You know, no matter how deep into need them I was, um, you know, sometimes I'd create problems to solve too. But I, I think depending on how comfortable your life is as a need, you start to really need to create problems to solve, to give yourself something to do, to keep your mind active. And I think this is just one of those. Hey everybody, I'm wearing my wife's shirt today because I've yet to do laundry and literally everything smells terrible. Of course, normally around this house I just wouldn't wear clothes because I don't have to do that anymore. But right now I am because I do not want to subject you to all of this. Anyway, I've been watching old videos of mine as I periodically do like every six months to take a mental note of how I've changed and where I'm at now and how I used to be. And what I noticed was really weird because um, as it's to be expected, I've changed, but the specific ways in which I've changed, um, uh, so I just deserted that clip, right? Like I literally ended it before I could say anything of note or really anything at all. And I feel like that's indicative of not just how my contents changed, but also how I've changed. That kind of self-reflective, meta, up-your-own-ass, just talking about the, the deepest, most specific aspects 
of one's consciousness uh, and personal narrative or whatever, even just describing it this way, I feel gross. But, like, that whole vibe, that, that style, doing things that way, it's off-putting to me now. I do that now, and I feel, like, overly self-indulgent. I feel like I'm not talking about anything interesting. I feel like I'm not adding anything of value. I feel like I've been there and I've done that. And that everything that's introspective about myself that is like meta in that way has either already been said or if there's new things to be said on that front, as in the case as is the case in this video, it's boring for me to do because I've done that style so much that it's like headache inducing. Or because I've changed so much that I find it to be pretentious and overly self-indulgent to engage with that stuff. And so now I'm in this position where I'm trying to talk about how I've changed, like merely for the sake of itself. And I can't. I feel like I can't. Every time I do one of these reflective videos now, unless I'm strictly telling a story, like one that has a clear uh, beginning, middle, and end, or unless I am trying to make a point out of the story that I'm telling or uh, whatever I'm reflecting on, I, I just cease to be interested in it. Like, those are the two circumstances on which I can make a video like this. I need to be saying something that can help somebody. Because I don't feel like just overanalyzing my own experience with the world for the sake of itself or for the sake of being meta helps anybody anymore. I feel like it used to help people. People liked having someone ramble on all day, or they liked having someone who thought or talked kind of like them, it made them feel less lonely. But, like, if you want that, you can just go back through my channel. I can just go back through my channel if I want that. I don't want that. I want the reflections that I have the introspection that I do to have a meaningful impact in that it is used as a vehicle for transforming oneself into a better person. You know, there, there's a child screaming in the background. I always get a little irked by that because I immediately want to go help, but their parents are there. Uh, anyway, um, you know, to transform oneself in a positive way. And that's the point now. And that's what I'm doing now. You know, I think one of these interesting facts about addiction that is often overlooked is that it is... A lot of it is up to how you view yourself. So there's a certain self-fulfilling prophecy that one partakes in when they refer to themselves as an addict, you know, of whatever, if you call yourself a smoker or a drunkard or uh, an addict of cannabis or something, it, you're going to end up feeling like you were that person because now you have tied your identity to this habit or tendency that you have. And it's even worse if it's not literally a habit. Like, it's already bad if it's a habit of yours, but if it's just something that you do and then you're referring to yourself as this as a kind of way to go down on yourself or to be critical, or to be humble, uh, it's not good, because you're going to be identifying 
with uh, dependence on something, which is bad. I mean, you, that should not be a part of your identity. The things that should be a part of your identity are the things that you can reasonably brag about, like your accomplishments, uh, your the parts of your routine that are uh, healthy, you know, your job, like your education, whatever it may be, the way that you make people around you happy, the way you make them feel, your contributions to your community. These are things worth identifying with. Even just your interests are worth identifying with. But there are people who will identify with these negative attributes that they might not even have. And that's bad. And I think societal stigma is a part of this. You know, when society stigmatizes literally anybody who uses a substance or a particular type of substance as problematic, no matter what their situation is, those people are going to feel down on themselves. They're going to feel critical of themselves. They're going to either um, start identifying with these characteristics that don't actually apply to them, or they're going to overcompensate and feel extremely insecure in the light of this criticism and try to do everything that they can to deny, deny, deny... And what it creates is this difficult situation where you have people who would otherwise be okay actually falling into worse tendencies, and then people who probably should get some help not getting it because they don't want to admit that they're one of, quote-unquote, those people. And then you have everybody else who's doing fine. Um, it's this weird situation where the way that people see these things, or, or rather the way that the broader society, the you know, global community sees these things, affects our sense of self. And actually affects our actions, because the way that we see ourselves in many ways, informs what our actions will be. Um, and so the self-fulfilling prophecy is really not something that can be um, shoved to the side when talking about addiction. In addition to that, I also think that the more that you think about a thing, and this ties into identity, the more that you think about a thing, the more likely you are to do that thing. So let's say, for example, you've gone one day without smoking, and then you think, oh, wow, I'm going a whole day without smoking. I'm doing a great job. Well, newsflash, you're thinking about smoking right now. What do you think that's going to lead to you doing? probably it's going to lead to you smoking. And so it's not about praise or criticism. It's about thinking about the thing. If you're thinking about the thing constantly, then you're going to fail in your desire to stop doing that thing. Instead, what you need are effective alternatives that fill your time, make you less lonely, give you pleasure of some kind, or at least occupy your brain, to the point where you're not thinking about those things. And then you're going to be able to escape that habit or that addiction or whatever. But the more that you criticize yourself for that thing, or inversely praise yourself for that thing, is the more that you're going to be thinking about it. And thinking about it is the problem. Um, so your identity matters a lot here. 
it plays a huge role in forming the reality that you live in. Your worldview is, is forming the reality that you live in. And I can even relate this to myself. I can relate this to myself in terms of how I've gotten off different drugs, which is by not thinking about them and by going to places where I don't associate with those things. I've done it by not seeing myself as having my will tied to those things. But also, I failed in said endeavors by not having effective alternatives by not effectively getting myself out of the places that I associate with that stimuli, and by seeing myself as someone who will engage in those behaviors. All of those things come together to reinforce a habit. So we have to be careful with how we th talk about this stuff. It, we have to be careful about how we talk to each other. We have to not stigmatize our neighbors. And we have to go at our own pace with these things. Because you might be warning someone against what they're doing. And then inversely create a situation where they come to identify with their behavior... And then their behavior gets worse, because now they're identifying with it. And that's a dangerous thing. Um, but we want to create an encouraging environment for our peers, where we encourage them to be the best people that they can be. But that's a fragile thing. Like... That's something that can only really be cultivated with an acknowledgement that people go at their own pace. And we might have our own opinions about what they're doing, but ultimately the more brazen we are about that, the more likely the outcome that we don't want to see will probably happen. It's an interesting idea, right? I'm still trying to remember your topic. I still can't remember my topic yet. Sorry. It's over. But I am using your head as a tripod. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's true. I mean, it's kind of hard to remember my topic with all of this in front of me, babe. Mm -hmm. It's canceling. Uh, no. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm never going to let you do that. Mm. Yeah. Man, oh man, I hate borders. I really do. And more than anything, I hate the border that separates the United States and Canada. And more than anything, I hate the welfare systems that exist in the United States and Canada. Because I feel like at every level of government, I've just been fucked. I've been fucked. I look at my best friend No Thank You and that flaming harlot Jezebel that he lives with and they're doing great. Even though they're from two different countries, it's on the same continent, they make it work. But I struggle with navigating the immigration system in either of our respective countries. It's extremely complicated, extremely bureaucratic, and I struggle to maintain the disability payments that, for all intents and purposes, at this point in my life, I'm not saying I, I should be on it forever, I don't think so, I basically need, like... I'm still trying to get a hygiene down, and I'm expected to work over 
40 hours a week to sustain a place to live and everything else. Like, it's ridiculous. But me being able to consistently stay with her is contingent on me being able to have an income that is 125% over the federal poverty line. So, I'm basically just fucked in, in all directions. Like, unless I can follow this extremely narrow path that I, in particular, struggle with, it's just kind of GG for me. And all because this arbitrary line designated between these two countries has been set. And if you go beyond that for too long of an amount of time, you've done something bad. It's insane. It's insane that they would divide people who are in love with each other, who want to be married to each other, who are married to each other. It's insane that they would divide those people merely on the basis of that arbitrary line. And that they would make them continually being able to be with one another contingent on certain abilities that one or more people might not necessarily have yet at that time. It's insane. It's just insane. And I just... I have to envy my friend there because even though he dates this evil, extremely unreasonable person, you know, at least he can consistently see them because they're on their disability and they're able to live on that pretty comfortably. And he's got his stuff that I won't go into basically those two don't have to work and yeah they're only allowed a certain amount of time in each country but they just go back and forth you know, without any issues but it would be so expensive for us to do the same thing that it like in order to stay together it's basically contingent on me being able to become a functioning human being in such a short span of time and I just don't know if I can do that I mean I have to try above all else and I have to try really hard I have to believe in myself I have to give myself a chance but There are times in life when your best simply is not enough. And my fear, the, the thing that I'm afraid of, is that this is one of those situations where my best simply won't be enough. And I know that because she and I love each other, we'll always have these crafty solutions. There's, there's always going to be a way, perhaps not the most comfortable way, but... I just want to fucking be in the same place with her. Like, you marry the love of your life, and then these people from the government tell you that you can't be with them. Like, is that not patently absurd? You find someone that you love and that you want to stay with, and then this guy in a suit with a gun comes walking through the door and says, Nope, you can't stay with them anymore. This is what I mean when I say borders are an affront to human life. The idea that these arbitrary lines can separate two people who love each other, who exist in a holy union in the eyes of God, that these people must be separated. It's patently absurd. And that's not even to go in to the problem with exploration 
the fact that you know depending on the passport of your country of origin you won't be allowed to go to certain countries long enough to fully explore them it's all just land like even if they do let you in the fact that you have to do that document check and like all of go through all of these bureaucratic hoops meet all these arbitrary requirements just to explore some land like I should be able to just walk over the land if I want to. I should be able to walk as far and wide as I want. Why the hell not? It's my land as much as it's your land. That God put this land on the earth for us to enjoy and walk on and make use of. Even if you don't believe in a higher power, it's still there. Are you going to tell me that some government, some group of unelected bureaucrats can just divvy up the land for themselves and say, it belongs to these people based on whether or not they're born here or uh, even worse, what their ethnicity is? Like, I should be able to walk over it whenever I want to, as much as I want to. It's my land. It's my land and it's also your land. And I think this is one of the reasons why I resonate with as as many problems as there were with the Western expansion in the United States. I, I resonate with it on a spiritual level because a lot of it was just about land. It was about securing land for the American people, which is why in the western states most of the land is under control of the federal government and can be freely explored by anybody. And it goes for so many thousands of of uh kilometers. Yeah. I mean how many presidents have been inaugurated and then at their inauguration the song that they sing is literally this land is your land it it's an american classic it's one of the most patriotic songs in existence and it's literally about being like a homeless drifter walking on the land this vast land in america and then seeing a sign that says private property and then just continuing to walk on the private property like <laughs> it, it's the the message of the song is that this land is so beautiful and belongs to all of the people who have came here that um it can't be owned by anybody and and that's actually a song against private property as a concept uh, but it's also a song about um about traversing this land in in a, a truly free way you know free from want free from material constraints as an adventurer um it like the idea that just because i'm in the united states and i can't do the same thing in canada just because of where i was born just because of the nationality of my parents it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. We need to open the borders. Okay. Hello, Dotesmite. Oh, what's up? No, thank you. <laughs>